What's going on, everybody? What's going on? I feel like I start the show the same way every time. I don't know why, but I do. Um, Shane Gomal, mon ami. I'm Good so day. excited to have you, man. I am so excited to have you. And um, I got to say, that was a fast season. Let me tell you right now. Can I just do the first <laughs> true. <laughs> like, That's oh true. My. Flew like, by. Didn't seem like that long ago that, uh, you know, and, and I think back now, I'm like, okay, the Kirby Doc injury does seem like forever ago, but that season flew by. So that's what I'm telling you right now. But, uh, dude, we got a lot to cover. So I, I told my viewers, you know, I, I didn't even do a reaction video because I learned this season very quickly that I can't do a post game after every single Habs game. I, this isn't HFR. This isn't Habs fan reaction. Like I tried Steve Dangle and I even met throughout the season on this channel. We talked. I had an interview with him. We skated together. We watched yeah. some record a podcast. And I had to come to realize that, like, I know my name is derived after Steve's, and he gave me the green light personally to do it. I'm not doing this full time for a living right now. So I can't do it. <laughs> and I'm start, start, sorry to randomly start the show off talking about me. <laughs> but uh, the fact is, I realized, Shaner. This is harder than it looks, even though our hearts are in it. But you're a little closer than I am. You're doing this full time on the Sick Podcast, and uh, we got a lot to talk about, including an interview that you just did just before you jumped on with me. So, yeah. Yeah. that being said, let's get to the content of the day. The Montreal Canadiens season ends, but it does end on what we feel are several high notes, and of course, Marty Saint Louis. <laughs> we, we get that from him too, right? I mean, always focusing on the positives. And that's what we kind of done with the Habs activity on Habs tonight. That's where it all started for us in talking about this team, trying to always focus on the good because it's just better than being negative all the time. I don't know. It's easy to focus on what's wrong. Yep. All right. Caulfield, Suzuki, Slavkovsky, all career highs this season. The top line for the Canadians emerges with a, with force and maybe a bit beyond expectations for some of us. Logan Mayu, Lane Hudson's debut. You met Lane Hudson last night at the Habs sure home closer. And we're going to show you a picture of that in a moment, folks. Um, yep. And Luke Tuck signs with the Montreal Canadiens. In fact, there will be a brand spanking new interview with Shingamon Grant McCagg on the recruits draft cast. And when will that be coming up? Because we're, we're, I'm releasing this tonight. It's We're recording this at about 5.20. Yeah. Um, when are you expecting that pod to drop? By the time this is up, the other one will be up as well. Uh, 6 <laughs> okay. p.m. 6 p.m. is up. So uh, Beautiful. Yeah, as, as soon as you're done watching this, you can go watch Luke Tuck. Well, you you put it whatever order you want. I would say put you know Luke Tuck first, whatever. Whatever you guys want to do. Shaner interviewed newly signed Montreal Canadiens 2020 draft pick Luke Tuck, second rounder. He's a power forward. Mm -hmm. he's we're, we're gonna get to him we're gonna get to him struble baron mayu they and and joshua Wa rejoin laval for their final playoff push this weekend shaner it's a huge huge weekend for the laval rocket massive jeff gordon all right so we didn't we didn't get a chance to dig too deep on the jeff gordon kent hughes press conference to end the season today but we did get a couple of nuggets this being one of them and we're going to talk about that we're also going to talk about the strong finish to the season for this line for the Canadians, Brendan Gallagher, who had a great finish to the season, despite all the criticism he's gotten in the last season or two. And Alex Newhook, UL Armia, like, talk about strong finish to the season. So these are the crux of what we're going to talk about today. So we'll get right to it and we'll try to limit it because, you know, you and I just don't do that. We talk forever. We love this team. Yeah, that's it. We love our Habs. But uh, Shaner, I think maybe we'll just start with the fact that you were at the Final home game at the Bell Center last night, and you got a chance to meet number 48, Lane Hudson himself. That's right. Uh, somebody that you interviewed on the draft on the recruits draft cast. You also interviewed his father, Rob Hudson, who also is a gem holding the sick hat there because that's just what you, that's the right thing to do. Um, and uh, you had a chance to meet these guys after the game, Shanner. But let's maybe just start with Logan Mayu, Lane Hudson. And their debut the last two nights we saw two games of Lane Hudson, two primary assists in his debut in his first two games. Logan Mayu with a secondary assist in his yeah. NHL debut, but Sheener, neither of these guys disappointed in their debuts, not even close. No, 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 no disappointment. In fact, I think they surpassed expectations if that was possible. Uh I mean, 
today Logan Mayu was was uh, named to the All Rookie AHL team. So an- yet another accolade for him this year. He's been phenomenal, fantastic, and yesterday was no different. Um, I I absolutely adored what I saw. He was getting big matchups and big minutes, right? Playing with Matheson on that first pairing. He he went to get he went up against you know Dylan Larkin, Lucas Raymond, right? The big boys over at, in Detroit. So, uh, and I thought he handled it perfectly. I thought he was he was physical. Uh, he wasn't shy. He wasn't. He didn't seem nervous. He didn't make any any stupid plays, right? Um, I w- I was thoroughly impressed, and and you know the same goes for Lane, right? Playing with with Papa Savard. Um, I think <laughs> it's absolutely the best, the best pairing for him, but, uh, you know, he, he, he went up against Patrick Kane most of the night, right? Yeah. That was awesome. Idol growing up, which is awesome, but uh, nonetheless, he contained him, right? The only thing Patrick Kane did yesterday was score a shootout goal. So, uh, that's, that's in large part because of lane. He, I thought, you know, a lot of people saying, oh, he's, he's not good defensively. He can't contain in his own zone. Not true. Right, sure, he's not going to be the most physical guy, but he is so smart. His hockey IQ is just beyond everybody's, and he can position himself in a way to contain the offense. I saw that yesterday, and you know, close up. I got you know, I moved seats down. So, okay, I was sitting in the nosebleeds for the first two period, and then shout out to our good friend Marco, who was sitting in uh, section one hundred five. Uh, and a large part thanks to his girlfriend, Sabrina, shout out to them, but they said there were two seats available next to them. So, uh, I went down and watched the third, the overtime and the shootouts. So I got a pretty good view of the boys and, uh, yeah, thoroughly impressed Drew. Well, I, I got to see Lane, not on, not in person, like you did up close. Cause you're, you're a stud and you're, you got, you guys are <laughs> practically neighbors now, but, uh, you mentioned the way he contained and how he played defensively and we saw like his first period of his first NHL career against the Red Wings. And the atmosphere was electric in Detroit, by the way. That was a yeah. fun-looking place at Little Caesars Arena to go mm-hmm. see that game. And Lane back-checked and got you know, got back. I mean, like I, I think he got maybe, – maybe he didn't get back on the one goal, the first goal, Detroit goal in, in the in the game in Detroit. But, I mean, like that wasn't entirely his fault. But the point is – what I'm saying is I think he showed he can play better defensively than he was given credit for initially. And then offensively, just the oh. elusiveness and, you know, what you thought was his first NHL goal ended up being Slavkovsky's for <laughs> a good little chunk of 250 grand bonus for that. So I think Slav bought about 20 steak dinners for everybody or yeah. he's going to be doing that. Um, but you thought you thought Lane scored his first goal. Tell me about that moment. I mean, <laughs> he was dancing on that blue line the whole night. It was so beautiful to see, right? You see her on, on footage when he does it in college. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to see it in person. It's even better. Drew, it's <laughs> even better in person. It's it's mesmerizing. This guy's going to embarrass forwards for 20 years, okay? <laughs> he's he's going to break so many ankles. It's ridiculous. But Dude, I again, call him the ankle breaker. That's my nickname. Honestly, like, he he's, he's just I, – I, I don't even want to think about being a forward trying to, you know – figure out where he's going to go and wh- what he's going to do. Like he, I think David Perron actually did the best thing and he just backed off. He just <laughs> backed off of Lane at one point. I just saw that. Like he was trying to trying to follow him around. And at one point he just gave up. He's like, all right, do your thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll cover another guy. But um, yeah, when, when he shot that puck and it went in um, it was, so I was sitting on, on the other side of the, of the ice. So, uh, from my angle, it looked like it was his goal. So I was freaking out. Obviously, I thought I just saw his first NHL goal, but tip by Slav. Honestly, uh, I'm I'm still happy, right? He gets the primary assist, two primary assists in two games. Not too shabby. I think uh, I think we're gonna see that for for quite some time, eh? <laughs> Man, it was just it was just cool because I mean I mean again, like we're gonna talk about Slavkovsky and Suzuki and Caulfield's line, and the, the fact that the circumstances of that goal was just like a win, win, win. I mean, it would have been nice Absolutely. to have Lane get his first goal and you'd be right there and everything else. And, you know, in, the, in, in, in sort of like a Ryan Paling search situation, I know it wasn't, wouldn't have, had, wouldn't have been a hat trick, but the fact that, uh, you know, just him scoring that goal, Slavkovsky getting his 20th, like just barely getting his bonus and then mm-hmm. also getting 50 points. We, we all like numbers. Like if we're honest, right. we all like numbers. We like production. 
that's why we want it. Like the numbers tell a story, right? And so I, sort of the advanced analytics, I'm coming around everybody. Okay. I'm not just about the eye test, even though that's, but that's how I've watched hockey. A lot of the years here is, and I think a lot of us have before advanced anal anal analytics came out. I think a lot yeah. of us still do go by the eye test. So what you saw from Lane though, the shiftiness, the creativity, it, it looked just like one of his college games when he had the puck, like he wasn't afraid to wheel around the zone mm -hmm. and do his thing and he didn't really cough the puck up much didn't turn over much i mean i know it was an early impression it's a small sample size but this is a title i want to put up here from a previous video that i did because i feel like the habs will need to adapt to how hudson quarterbacks the power play eventually whether it's on the second unit to start so matheson can still be on the first and what i mean by that is the way he moves around so much i think the canadians are if 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 i'm reading it correctly the way how mobile Hudson is it just seems to me like the Canadians are going to have to not not that they're stagnant now but like you got a couple guys moving back and forth on the half wall like Suzuki and Caulfield kind of rotate a little bit right. uh, Slav goes to the front of that sometimes he's on the half wall I think there's just going to be more movement in general more deception there's going to be more room for deception so that like you know you don't even know who to defend in the Habs power play eventually Hudson's going to be quarterbacking it and there's going to be so much movement puck movement but player movement specifically so that you're not going to be able to predict where guys are going to go maybe it's too much movement in my head because it sounds great but i just feel like he's so good on his feet what do you what do you make of where i'm going with this does that kind of make sense honestly okay so alex burrows is out of a contract so let's just assume that he signs another run right he's extended he's still the power play coach i would love to be in his shoes because having these tools to work with right it's like endless possibilities. You can, you, you know, you're limited by your creativity. So uh, whatever the, the coaching staff decides to do, right. What, what kind of system they want to run. Um, they, they have so many options, right? Lane can just do about anything in the offensive zone. It's like having five forwards really. Yeah. And, and I, I think, <laughs> I mean, I'm just excited to see it. Uh, yesterday we saw like a smidge, he was on the second power play. Unfortunately, I would love to. I would have loved to see him on the first, but nonetheless, he's going to be on the first very soon. And you know what? A lot of people are saying, "Oh, maybe he will start the season in Laval next year." You know, don't expect them to make the team out of camp. Nope, nope. He's not touching Laval. He's not touching Laval. I'm tell you right now, really? it would make it would make no sense for him to play to play in Laval because he wouldn't learn. He wouldn't learn in Laval. He would stay the same. Sure, he'd be on the first power play. He'd dominate. But he needs to play against the best and with the best in order to improve, in order to, to see what he is lacking and improve on those facets. Slaff, right, we were talking about sending him down because he was lacking confidence. Jack Eye was sent down because he was lacking confidence. It seemed like Barron was sent down because he was lacking confidence. That's why you send guys down to Laval. It's not to develop them. It's to help them get their game back. Lane Hudson knows what he's doing, and he is confident out there. He like he knows that he will embarrass people, right? And he will he will do it. He will do it. But he needs to make those mistakes in the NHL in order to learn from them, in order to grow. So I'm going to tell you right now, he's not seeing the rocket. That's pretty bold, and, and maybe it isn't because of what we've seen, like confidence was on full display though like he did not look at a place no oh okay the guy's smaller than your average defenseman whatever so is toy so was toy Krug, quinn hughes you know the guys that you know have typically been you know propped up right in the in today's nhl as an as star defenseman but it's interesting you say that because um certainly his dad rob doesn't believe that it's out of the realm of possibility everyone just assumed it's going to be hudson and rhinebacker in laval next year so that may not be the case from what I'm gathering. Maybe it's going to be Engstrom and Rhinebacker in Laval next year. I think that's more probable. I, that I seems do. to me like maybe. So so what makes you say that fairly quickly here, just by you know the first little tester? What makes you really think that? Uh, is it just the confidence right now, and that and you, it's like a Slavkovsky situation where you just like are, are they using what they did with Slav to the point where it's like if guys are ready, they're ready. We're not going to hold them back. 
Exactly. Right. I think, right. Okay. So the beginning of the season, we were talking about, okay, maybe they're not developing Slav properly. In yep. fact, they were, they were, that's exactly how you handle a high uh, offensively potential player like that. Right. These, these elite minds, these elite hockey minds need to be around the best at all times in order to, to play at their best and to grow and to learn. I want I want Lane learning from David Savard, from Mike Matheson, from Caden Gooley, from from Stefan Rabida. No disrespect to Laval, right? But I want him to learn from the best. He is he is at that level. Like we saw it. We have we have proof in front of our eyes. He is at that NHL level, and he will make mistakes. Okay, don't get me wrong. He will make mistakes. Everyone does. He's a rookie defenseman. You can expect those mistakes, and there it's a good thing. It's a good thing. He needs to make those mistakes in order to learn. And he'll have the coaching staff and the tools and, and the, the, the help to learn. So if, if he struggles at any point in time, I'm not sending him back. I'm not sending him down to Laval. I'm keeping him up and I'm giving him the reps because that's what he needs. He's, he's, he's at a level that is beyond the AHL. He, like, I'm not saying he'll get bored or, he, you know, anything like that. There's players that need to go through the AHL to make that transition to then the NHL. He's already at the NHL level. He is. So what's the point of sending him to Laval? I, to me, it, it's just clear. I, I really don't see him going there. Is this a, just a situation where he's got it and you got to you got to feed feel the fire? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. That's how you develop a player like that, right? Elite, elite skill. When's the last time we've had a player like we can talk about in that sense where like he's he's already got it? You know, Caulfield Caulfield started his career in Laval. Mm -hmm. Took him ten games. Uh, sorry, no, two games. He started two games in Laval, scored four points, and then he went up with the Habs. Right, all five five points in ten games. Then after that, with the whole Dominic Sham thing, he lost confidence. It's not like he he didn't know what he was doing he needed to adapt this guy was an nhl skilled player but he needed to get his confidence five points in six games in the valve boom back with the Habs, right and now we see 65 points in 82 games terrific season fantastic that's what he needed okay if lane loses confidence which i don't think he will because that that guy knows he's him he's him okay but if <laughs> ever he does then maybe you you you, you play with that option but right now like no not a chance so if that's the case uh dare i ask and i didn't have this as a title but um how much how much movement do you think we're going to see on the blue line for the habs in the off season in terms of guys coming in and going out not a ton uh maybe i mean <laughs> yesterday we were reminded that chris weidman is still with the team no disrespect <laughs> to him Love the guy. I'm, I'm sure he's he's loved by teammates, right? Cole Caulfield loves loves that guy. But uh, I don't know. Love Hoffman to too. So there you go. <laughs> exactly. That's okay. Um, listen, I don't, I don't know that he'll play. I don't expect them to play. I think the depth is way beyond him. Um, maybe he goes to Laval. But with the halves, I mean, Matheson's not going anywhere. People. Okay. 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 Well, we're we're gonna get we're gonna get into a tangent here. I don't want to get sidetracked. But anybody saying to trade Matheson is off their rocker, please give your head a shake. You don't trade a guy like Mike Matheson. You keep him around and you let your young guys learn from him. This is a beyond sixty point defenseman. Those don't come by very often. Okay. And I'm and I get the argument that oh, you want to maximize his value. You want to trade him now. While he's worth a lot, sure. Yeah. But wouldn't it be more more valuable for your young players, your future decor, to learn from a guy like that? I think, to me, there's there's no debate. I'm not trading Mike Matheson unless you unless a team overpays by a lot. He's not moving. Okay, he's not moving. So he's he's staying there. Gooley's coming back. Uh, Gooley's coming back healthy. Savard is not moving either. OK, until maybe the deadline, then you, you start thinking about it. But in, in the summer, he's not moving again. You need him for guys like Hudson, for guys like Mayu, Jack Iguli. They're still learning. Right. Linebacker. 
Reinbacker is going to come up at some point. Like he might come up and, you know, he's going to get mentored by Savard. You would hope before he leaves, <laughs> before Savard that goes is, out the door. Yeah. That is the guy you want your, your young players to learn from. Jack I had a fantastic end of year. Okay. Again, he lost a bit of confidence, went down, got it back, played fantastic, came back up. Look at that. He's an NHL player. No debate about it. Okay. On the, on that right side. I mean, Struble has been good. Harris has been good. We saw that Mayu can handle it. There's a lot of options. I don't know that there'll be movement. Maybe one or two get dealt, but I don't think we're there yet. You know, the the defensive purge that is upon us, because uh, there is going to be one. There is going to be one. A lot of those Ds are going to have to go at some point. I don't think we're there yet. Well, that brings me to my next quote with uh, Jeff Gordon, VP of Hockey Operations with the Canadien de Montréal, uh, who was hilarious today in the press conference. It was nice to see the, the <laughs> always is. humor, right? <laughs> yeah, always is. That guy's awesome. Like, they're a family, man. Like, they're they're creating not just, like, a brotherhood with the players. I mean, they're the Canadians really have that sense of family. And, like, when I went up to meet all of them last year, they were all hanging around each other. And, like, there was just a calm vibe. Mm -hmm. And, like, Kent, Marty, Jeff, even Bob, Rav, LaPointe, all those guys were just... There was there was a there was a sense of calm, and that was last season. Now there's a sense of more anticipation coming, right? And that's what brings me to this quote from Jeff Gordon. This is a huge summer for us, and that's why I asked you about potentially moving defensemen too, because that means there might be more movement. But what it sounded like he was saying was, you know, he was talking about improving the roster. And when it comes to saying something like this, this is a huge summer. It, it's referring to the draft. It's referring maybe to a free agent if one becomes available that's attractive to them. But it's also about trades. And that's where mm -hmm. they've made the majority of their moves is they made a lot of deals since Gorton and Hughes have been here. So what do you make from this quote from Jeff Gorton? What's What do you think he's uh, getting onto here specifically? He's absolutely right. Because this, this summer is supposed to be this transition period, right? If you remember... I, I, I mean, I was there right? the uh, the golf tournament before the season. Yep. Uh, they didn't want to say playoffs. They said the P word. We're not we're not we're not we're not going to talk about the P word yet. Well, I fully expect them to talk about that P word in this coming dra uh, golf tournament. OK, mm -hmm. this is supposed to be this transition period to like, OK, we're done tanking. Let's actually compete. I'm not saying they're going to make the playoffs. If they do probably get bounced in the first round, which is fine. But it is that transition period to like, okay, we're actually competing now. Let's try it. Okay, let's let's give the tools to our guys to actually do it. Um, the draft is is obviously going to be huge because you're likely picking top five. Please, Arizona, please lose. Okay, uh, win. Sorry, win. Edmonton only, needs to lose. Edmonton they only have to beat lose. Edmonton, of course. <laughs> but McDavid's out of the lineup still. Hopefully, is so, he? I, mean, I don't. I don't know. I, I think he's supposed oh, to be. I don't know. If please, I could be wrong on that. Rest. Get ready for the playoffs, Connor. Okay, you don't need to play this one. Uh, and it's the last <laughs> home game uh, for Arizona, right, before heading to Utah. So maybe they give the fans a good show. Please, please, just win. Just win. So Looks um, like David is starting from what I can see. I could be wrong, but anyway. Uh, go hey, ahead. Oh, sorry. They can still win. They can still win. So uh, <laughs> likely a top pick for top five pick for the Habs. Um, we'll, we'll get into the draft, you know, once the lottery gets in. But yeah. That's going to be a whole. Like, other this episode. could be a big one. This could be a big one. We could get like the Habs could get a, a very very good forward here, even maybe a defenseman. Okay, Come we're on. not going to do what we did last year, Drew. I know your face. I know your face. We're not going to do what we did last year. This discounting was discounting all defensemen from the draft. It's a possibility. If the best player available is a defenseman, you got to take him. You can't. You can't fault. The management and the scouting team, if they do, you got to take them. So best player available. OK, that's it. But uh, the draft free agency, could they make a splash? I don't think they're there yet. They're not. I don't think they're going to sign a big name. People yeah. are saying, ah, Jonathan Marcheseau, right? They make the French connection and all that stuff. I don't think I think of he's going to ask for way too much money for the Habs to be comfortable. Um, I don't expect that to happen. Maybe, you know, you know, smaller uh free agents perhaps but like you said the trade okay two years in a row now they made big trades kirby doc alex newhook i think there's a third coming drew i think there's a third they have the draft capital and at this point they can start liquidating that capital 
They can start trading those late first round picks. They have two again next year. Could they trade another one of those, right? They have Winnipeg's this year, Calgary's next year. There could be something going on with that. Uh, they, they have the young players. So they, they have a lot to trade. They have a lot of, of assets that can be moved to improve the team now. Uh, all the while not jeopardizing the future of the team. I think Kent said that today, or maybe it was yeah. Jeff, but right. It's, it's all about building for the future. And if, if they can make a move, right. Kent said, he's not, he's not going to push for something. If it presents itself to him and it's a trade that makes sense for now and the future of the team, he's going to do it. And we've seen how good those trades are. I mean, <laughs> Alex Newhook is, Oh, I love that guy. I just love him. I saw him live yesterday. His skating is out of this world. Um, and I got to see him as well uh, after the game waiting for Lane. And let me tell you, his legs, tree trunks. Okay, he's got some He's got some quads on him. Let me just say that. Love the guy. So he's got the Marty St. Louis program going. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's just jump right into that then. So we got uh, this line that emerged for us later in the season here. You yeah. um, all are me of finding his game getting a career high in goals, uh, finishing with 17 or 18, was it? I think it was 17. But uh, Brendan Gallagher impressed me too. And uh, for him to continue to have a role on this team for what is being paid is 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 important because he's not going anywhere. But I liked what I saw from Galli. I mean, I just we, – we know he's been a heart, the heart and soul for so long. And then mm -hmm. last couple of years here through the rebuild, beginning stages of the rebuild, I should say, he's been criticized quite a bit just because of what he's being paid. You know, all that good, all that not so good stuff, I would say, actually. But I like the way he played lately, and Marty's been helping him to evolve his game. Armia finding his game again, finding his passion again. And then you got Alex Newhook between them. And this was actually, other than the top line, was the other most consistent line to the end of the yep. season, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, Galley, I remember before the season, everybody was saying, ah, he's done. He's done. He can't keep up the pace. Um, he's washed. It's over for Galley. Yeah. Listen, I will, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll keep the show PG friendly, all right? But uh, Galley just you. basically <laughs> pulled everybody off and said, yeah, I'm still here, baby. I'm still here. I can play. Um, he, what Galley needed to do this summer and, and before the season was adapt his game, right? He knows that he can't keep up. So he's adapted his game. He's he's playing a different sort of of hockey, and and it's it's to his advantage. Obviously, he had a a really good season. I mean, you can't you can't fault the guy. Uh, he gave it his all every game, and that's all you expect from from your your assistant captain, one of the leaders on this team. Uh, he he definitely has a spot on on this roster, and and he does he belongs in the NHL still. Uh, anybody discounting Gallagher uh, is not watching hockey. Uh, really not. And, and listen, Armia, I mean, <laughs> that guy got dragged through the mud. If anybody, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just really happy for him to be honest with you. He's, yeah. he's deserved it. He played fantastic in Laval for, he only played eight games, right? But he was awesome. Nine points in eight games and then comes back and he's just on a tear and 17 goals. I, like you said, uh, I mean, what is he fourth in, in goal scoring on the team or fifth? Something like that, right? For yeah. a guy that missed some games, he only played 66 games. That's excellent. That's excellent. And let's not forget his his defensive uh capabilities, right? On Huge. the PK, Huge. on the PK, him and Evans, right? That that's their bread and butter, these guys. They they live on the PK, they do fantastic work there. Uh, we we've seen Armia being more engaged, and that's really the main complaint that fans had right it's the lack of consistency it's sometimes he does he looks like he doesn't want to be there but you really you, you can't say that this season uh he he yeah. showed up every game and and he was noticeable yesterday again i noticed him he was he he was really strong yeah he, he was and it's funny gallagher finished just behind army and goals too because galley had uh 16 and army had 17 and this was Brendan Gallagher's first 30 plus point season since 1920, where he had 43, 52, and 54 before that. But uh, both Br Gallagher and Armia, similar points in their careers. I mean, Gallagher is going to be 32 next month, but still three more years on his, on uh, 
st- still three more years on the cap. And then Armia, this is his last season mm-hmm. um, under this current contract. But what they did together was just a clear sign that Marty can get through to everybody, man. Like it's just, yep. it's not just about coaching. I'm just saying that it definitely is the beginning piece of how you get your players motivated and stay motivated. So I don't know if Armia's agent was in his year two and like, hey, by the way, you all like uh, you got one more year left on your deal. If you want to cash in one more time, you better start showing it now because heading into next seat, right? Like, so that, that this is a building block maybe for his next contract. I don't know, but uh, whatever the case is, they impressed, and then New Hook, of course, impressed too. He's wow. been scoring. You know, he wow. finishes the seasons on a high note with what well, let's <laughs> let's pull up uh, Alex Newhook's points really quickly, because uh, I, I definitely wasn't disappointed with his production after coming back from injury mm-hmm. gone for what almost two months. He finishes the season with 30, 34 points. Um, and actually, that was a career high for Newhook, too, because he had 33 yep. with Colorado in 21, 22 when they won the cup. So 15 goals, 19 assists for Alex Newhook. And I mean. You know, you bring back Kirby Doc next season. Alex Newhook and Kirby Doc played together with Slav to start this year, which was looking really good. And then, you know, what happened? But I'm going I'm to jump into um, this next one because obviously it's the top line and I want to keep us rolling here. But uh, the emergence of this Habs top line, I actually had a discussion on another podcast that I've been doing locally here called Absolutely with a couple of gems here right down the street from me in Niagara Falls here. Big Habs fans. Uh, shout out to Paul and John. But Caulfield, Suzuki, Slavkovsky, I still am not like a thousand percent convinced that they're going to stay together for good. I don't know why. I could be off my rocker completely. They could just keep getting better and better and better and they'll stay together and we'll just have a wicked top second, a wicked top line or second line to work on and add another top six forward to. But regardless, what they showed us between the three of them this season, Shane, beyond expectations. Remarkable. Remarkable. And and listen, like you said, I don't nobody can predict the future, right? But uh this draft here could alter that line. Uh there That's are all I'm t- saying. There, there, there's <laughs> talent available that could absolutely change that lineup. But for now, this is the first line and it is worthy of being a first line. It is among the best in the NHL. Okay, so uh you say what you want, but like Suzuki's 24, Caulfield's 23, Slaff just turned 20. These guys are not in their primes, Drew, and they're already one of the best first lines in the NHL. Uh, it's it's beautiful to watch. They're building chemistry. Um, I mean, Slaff just, we saw how much he changed when he came on that line. It, at first, right, the points weren't really coming, but he was playing so good. And then at one, you know, at one point the the points came and they didn't stop, right? They just kept coming and kept coming, and and uh, he got rewarded for his efforts. They complement each other so well. Uh, if if this were the future of of the Habs, you know, first line and everything for for many years, I'd be thrilled. I'd be thrilled. I'd I'd be completely comfortable with this. But again, this draft could alter that. It could. For good reason, i.e. Caden Lindstrom, i.e. Demidov. Demidov. <laughs> we both said the same name. I love Celebrini. Uh, Celebrini. Not, Im- <laughs> not impossible. Not impossible. Yeah. I think uh, who won the lottery last several years that was that jumped up? Oh, it wasn't the, the Rangers? Well, that was like the COVID uh, crazy yeah. lottery. That, that that, cool. Yeah, that one we can discount. But I mean, uh, <laughs> New, New Jersey jumped to second in 2022, right? To pick up Nemec. They were not... Uh, they, they actually jumped up quite a bit there. Um, I mean, last year, Chicago jumped ahead of, uh, I think it was Anaheim. That was dead last. So uh, there's going to be movement, right? Draft lottery is, uh, uh, there's no confirmed daddy date. It's either May 6th or 7th. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. Well, That's at least we'll fun. know for sure. And like, it's going to be hard not to go to the forward route this year. I mean, Kent did at least hint at that they may draft for need because they need a forward more than they need a defenseman. Tell me I'm not. Yeah. I know I'm not, not this year. I'm not the last two drafts. I've been wrong. And that's why you guys are scouts. I'm not, but uh, <laughs> like to all the scouts out there, but I mean, um, we all know what we wanted collectively. It was a pretty big, you know, people wanted a forward last year, this year. I think it's just more necessary. Mm-hmm. But that being said, we're going to dive into the potentials for the draft, especially once we get to know where we're picking. So right now, as it currently stands before the final game of the season for the Arizona Coyotes, 
tent temporarily the Arizona Coyotes. <laughs> Almost yeah. going to be the Utah Coyotes or whatever. But um, we're going to find that out for sure after this podcast is already out there. Worst case scenario, the Habs are sixth last four lottery odds. Mm -hmm. And then best case scenario, they're going to be fifth last, like last year. So to have the growth that we did, Shane, and then still have the lottery position that we have, how satisfied are you with this season then? Uh, you know, I, I was telling my dad, I kept kept complaining that I think it's 14 uh, overtime points that we have, right? So those are 14 useless points, I call them. <laughs> um, but, you know, you look at the you look at the rankings, right? That would have made us finish fourth last, I think. So not a huge difference. Um, overall, I mean, we, we've seen growth. That's what we wanted before the season. We've seen the big the big players grow and heading in the right direction. They gain confidence and then in themselves, they 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 kind of ironed out their all-around game. I mean, Cole Caulfield getting um what was it? Hold on, my page is uh I think lagging finished here. 64 points, 28 goals, 37 assists. Yeah. 37 assists. So he's got this new um portion of this of his game right last year he had 10 assists so uh, if if he becomes a playmaker i mean all three of those guys are threats now you know if 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 cole is only the sniper then okay it's easy to cover him he's not going to get any goals if he can dish it too oh boy that's scary all three that's of them scary. can pass the puck really all well three, all three can pass all three can score that's what you want out of the first line. You don't want specialists, all right? Because then it's easy to cover them. You want all three threats. That's what they are. So I'm, I'm just beyond excited for what's to come. Uh, we got to wait till September for more hockey, but uh, I think it's going to be worth it in the end. Big, big draft coming up. Uh, I'm, I'm fully trusting the scouting team and the management to make the right decision they have in the past two drafts. I love what they've done so far. Uh, I know they're going to keep doing well. So right now I'm just enjoying the ride. I think this team has, has all the potential in the world. Uh, it's it's fine. There's a glimmer of hope. There's a glimmer of hope. Drew, I've in my lifetime, I've been, you know, I've, I've seen nothing but this circle of mediocrity with the Habs. You know, oh, they start being good. Oh, they won a playoff series. They're out. Okay, they suck, they suck, they suck. Oh, okay, we finally get to the Stanley Cup playoffs, we're out. They suck, they suck, they suck. And then right now we're heading towards consistent playoff success, right? Not just that one fluke, oh, we made it, cool. No, no, we're this team is pushing to be a playoff threat every single year. And it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I can see the vision and I'm excited. That's the one thing I like about the openness and the transparency of this current regime with Hughes and Gordon leading the way, because Jeff Molson obviously recognized that with like, yeah. these guys are visionaries, you know, like these guys have a plan and they're sticking to it as we know, but like you get the sense of what they're doing too. It's like, you're part of it They're It feels more like they're trying, even if they're, whether they're trying to do it or, do it or not, and I will say this, like how many podcasts did Jeff Gordon and Kent Hughes do this season? You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's a new way of communication with the fan base. That hasn't been seen before. That's something we just haven't seen, right? That's it. Marty will save his podcast appearances for the offseason, whatever. That's fine. But we want to talk to the guys who are building this thing. And we've had a chance to see them appear on several podcasts, and including the sick podcast. Jeff Gordon came on earlier in the season. Yeah, the eye test. Last season. No, he, he went on the eye test. test recently. And and uh, Pierre, Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy, uh, they also had Kent uh a few months ago now but yeah both yeah. of them came on that's what i mean like and, and mm -hmm. like they really seem to be the right guys for the job just that whole new positive energy is so contagious and i feel like they're bringing the fans into the experience of how we're how they're doing this i think montreal is just giving giving fans more access than ever before is that not true have you not noticed that it, the, it's much more transparent much more open uh letting the fans in on what's happening, right? Uh, you know, listen, Benjamin did good things. Okay, I'm not discounting him. He 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 brought us to the Stanley Cup final. He did. You can't discount that. He drafted some good players. He was there, right? But it felt like we were 
looking through a, like a, a painted window. Like we couldn't really tell what was going on. And once he got cleared, you know, that window got very clear. Uh, yeah. We knew that we knew that he wasn't letting the alumni in. He was he was pushing them away. Um, he was he was always just cryptic with everything, you yeah. know. Whereas this management group, they value the the former players much more. Uh, they 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 let in the fan. They let in they let the fans know what is happening. What is the plan? We we know where they're going, and that's that's different. And it feels good. Feels good. That's what I mean. That's the difference, right? And like mm -hmm. we, we saw it. We just saw Weiser, our boy Dale Weiss, at the Bell Center with Max Lapierre, Knuckles Nylon, and I forget who the fourth. I think it was Brees Bois. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I don't. I, you never even knew. We never, I didn't even know Weiser was going there. And like, yeah, they're, he's getting. They're getting the treatment and the love that they weren't getting in the alumni. And it's like, if you were a Montreal Canadian, no matter how long your run was, and they, and those guys made an impact, all of them. In the playoffs, Weiser. In the playoffs, Lapierre. You know, um, so all those guys. Breeze Ball, Stanley Cup winner, obviously. Uh, but mm -hmm. it goes on and on. But the point is, it's just such a different vibe now. And it's really been it's, it's been a treat. Um, I want to finish off on a couple more things before we head out here. And I want to jump to Luke Tuck. I know that the podcast is released and you guys already, have already watched it before this or you're about to watch <laughs> it after this. So um I got an I got a really interesting feeling about Luke Tuck, and I'm not saying he's going to be the next big thing in Montreal. However, there's something about his size and his meanness and his toughness reminds you a bit of how Florian Jacki is going to play and how they could complement each other on a future line, maybe with Owen Beck or something like that. I know I'm just making up a line. However, maybe Owen's got to play with a more skilled player like Mashar or something. Anyway, we'll get to that. You're, we got a lot of time for this rebuild, but. What are your impressions of Luke Tuck after talking to him and as a player? Do you see him as a future Montreal Canadian? What are your initial impressions? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I think he does have um, certain skill sets that other prospects don't in this in this team. So uh, Flora and Jacki, you mentioned, right? They they both play a very physical game. And and to and 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 Luke talking with him. Uh, he prides himself in that. He actually enjoys it. He he loves hitting guys. He loves being physical. He loves moving guys around, right, and and wearing them down. In the playoffs, that's the kind of player you want on your team. Yeah. All right. Um, I don't think he's gonna be putting up insane numbers. Like his brother Alex is is probably more gifted offensively, but I I, I think Luke is almost a lock to be an NHL player. Uh, what he does defensively too right he's an all-around power forward um he's very responsible defensively if if no if you guys haven't seen it yet um you know in in the game the quarterfinal game against denver university uh he scored a, a penalty kill goal just a beautiful beautiful goal short in uh, yeah that's it on the on the penalty yeah. kill so uh mm -hmm. he's got he's got those those facets to his game that some prospects, the most prospects don't. Uh, he's very mature mentally and physically. He's a big boy, right? 6'2", over 200 pounds. Yep. He can crush him. He can crush him and, and he can move too. He's not slow. I saw him at the development camp this summer and he really stood out. Like I, I really, really like what I saw. Um, I'm excited for him to join Laval. I think I think he can bring a, a really important dimension, especially in crunch time. Like these, these are games that Laval need to win. And this is the kind of guy I want on my team for that. Um, like I said, I think come playoff time, you'll see you'll see the real Luke Tuck. He's going to show up and show out. Fans are going to love him. I'm convinced. So I, I did mention uh, when I did mention earlier that um, Struble, Baron, Mayu, Wa are rejoining Laval, but Luke Tuck is joining them as well. Absolutely. So my gosh, like that's an influx of players. You wonder if it's enough time to get chemistry. So I wonder about that. So I understand from that point of view, but if it works, then it's going to look like a pretty genius move. I mean, Luke Tuck, 10 goals, 20 assists, 30, 30 points in 39 games. It was mentioned from whether it was Pierre Maguire with to talking to Tony on, on the sick podcast, how hard it is to score in college hockey and how Celebrini yep. just did it at a rate that was just unheard of. Right. Which that's one thing. 
But I mean, Luke Tuck, like that's that's not chump change to put up ten goals and twenty assists like that. I don't. He was playing with Celebrini, by the way. We should mention at the beginning of the season. Line mates, right? yep. We know that. I watched some stuff from Luke, and I thought, you know what? Like, that's an element that we just don't fully have from a prospect yet. The size, the grit, and the skill to go along with it. A guy that can mm-hmm. hold up a third or fourth line. So. I like what you have to say on Luke there, and uh, I'm going to leave it at that for now and let you guys catch the sick podcast for Chris Draftcast to hear the rest from Luke himself yeah. and, Shane and, and Shane and Grant. So uh, from there, my good man, uh, I think we'll finish with, well, you know what? Let's finish with Laval. So Struble, Baron, we just talked about it. So Struble, Baron, my and Wa rejoin Laval for this final push here. So how big would it be for the Canadians' prospects it seems obvious to ask this, but um, how big is it if they get into the playoffs and get that playoff experience for our young Habs prospects here? Or how how much of a big deal is it if they don't? Well, right now they're being put to the test. Like this is this is crunch time, right? This is when you got to step up your game to that next level. So it'll be very indicative for not only the management team, but like for the players as well. Can you keep up with the big boys? Can you step up when it's time to step up? And I, I think they will. I think they will. I'm, I'm being op- optimistic, obviously. But if they do make the playoffs, it, it can only can only help, right? The, you, those those big games, those big moments, uh, that's, that's when you play your best. You're supposed to play your best. So uh, we're going to see different sides of these guys, hopefully. Um, we're going to see them kind of take take opportunities as they come. You know, someone's going to have to play the hero and these guys all want to be that guy. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just excited. I really hope they get in. <laughs> I really hope. Well, it's too, it, they finish it, both games against uh, Ottawa's farm team, which is Barry, right? Or not Barry. Belleville. Um, Belleville. Belleville. Sorry, yeah. I was screwed that up. Uh, so they've played. It's been back and forth between the two of them from what I've yeah. seen. But yeah. regardless, uh, these are going to be some big games, and uh, it's only going to add to the excitement to see players like Luke and Logan back back with Laval, who had an outstanding season with the AHL, with the AHL's Laval Rocket. He's going to be itching to get back there, I think, mm-hmm. especially after getting a taste of the NHL game and coming back and having a bit more confidence, hopefully, too. Struble is going to rejoin them. More grit on the defensive side from him, and a guy who can skate too. Struble can skate, Baron can skate. Mm-hmm. So, and then Joshua Wah, if he's healthy too, I mean, this could be a great finish to the season. I'm really hoping for Laval's sake that they get in, and and that's what I'm hoping for. But Shana, on that note, I'm going to end it here. Uh, we talked about a lot, we covered a lot in this uh, episode, of course, and it's been a little while since we've jumped on together. And I just want to say, keep work, keep up the great work on Sick because. Uh, they are fortunate to have you. I guys hope I hope you guys know. I mean, I know Sam and Ellen know what they have in you, but I need to put it out there because you are uh, always a favorite to come on any show that you're on. But I feel like you just I, I we get to hear more of Shane's hockey brain and hockey <laughs> fan fan mind when you come on here. So I just I love that. So thank oh, you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, buddy. <laughs> love this guy. Love this guy right here. I don't care what anybody says. I love him. I love him. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. Appreciate it as always. Um, if you want to watch more on the channel, hit subscribe, hit like, and uh, certainly appreciate the support every time I'm able to jump on here. Even though it's not as often as I was at the start of the season, I certainly do it as much as I can, especially when I can get this guy on. So, thank you all very much for watching. Shaner, thank you again. It's been a sick show. Oh. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate y'all. You're the best. Thank you.